Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Severn Run Worship. It's good to see you all. Each week we have uh, more and more seats filled as we come back in waves from the sickness. Can you you can you hear me? But you just but you just said no. Yeah. (laughs) Nick, can you turn me up just a little bit? It's good to see you all. I'm hearing more and more cultural commentators say that if the church is going to make it, they're going to need two things. They're going to need each other, and they're going to need Jesus Christ. And I believe that's true. So I'm glad you're here uh, with each other, fellowshipping, and the most important thing that we can do, which is the worship of our God. Let's begin by opening in prayer. Please join me. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, We thank you that you have gathered us here. Lord, it is difficult enough. We are so thankful that we don't have to do this difficulty alone. We can look around this morning and say to ourselves, wait a second, we're not crazy. There are other people that believe what I believe too, who have been given faith, who have been given hope, and who have been given love. We ask Lord Jesus Christ as our King as our priest and as our prophet, that you would act in those offices this morning that we might glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would, in fact, work by your Spirit, that we would take these songs seriously, that we would take our confession seriously, and that you would lead us into repentance. We ask that we would take the reading of your Word seriously and that we would conscientiously hear your word. We ask, Lord, that we, when we behold you in the supper by faith, that we as your disciples would be strengthened to love you and to love our neighbor as wisdom dictates for our time and space. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for our call to worship from Psalm 149, verses 1 through 2. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Amen. Let us sing together, Come People of the Risen King.
Amen. It's good to hear your voices. We behold Christ now from Isaiah 8, 11 through 18. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be, you, let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Behold your Christ. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this vision that you have given to us of the great stumbling stone who is Christ himself. We thank you, Lord, that we need not ally with other nations. We need not fear conspiracies in the world. Though they conspire against you and your anointed, you have declared him to be the Son of God, and all power and authority has been given to him. Lord, we have failed to live according to this reality in many ways, and therefore I ask that you would be with us and our elder candidate this morning in our time of confession. I pray that his words would be your words to us and that you would work in us by your spirit. It will take that much to turn our hearts that are so dark to the light. We ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And Happy New Year. I know it's mid-January, but I, I don't like to make New, New Year's resolutions too early in the year. You tend to kind of get caught up and uh, make foolish decisions. Uh, so I like to wait a few weeks and then make a rational decision about my New Year's resolutions. So may I offer a suggested resolution? And you might want to write this down in your bulletin. Y'all need to lose some weight. <laughs> and I mean that with the utmost love and respect. Now, please don't feel too bad. You know, at one point, St. Peter himself needed to lose some weight. So let's look to St. Peter as an example on how to lose weight. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. So Peter was burdened. He was carried on his back a fear of the wind and the waves, instead of a fear of God. Now Peter was no dummy. When you're out on the water, and the sea is playing foosball with you, panicking is kind of a normal reaction. But what was really terrifying out there, what Peter missed in that moment, it wasn't the sea, it was the creator. Peter was being afraid of the wrong thing. So we need to ask ourselves, when Jesus calls us, are we unburdened enough that we can walk in faith? or do we start to sink beneath the waves? One is a weight that pulls us down, and the other, one, is, uh, one, one fear is a weight that pulls us down under the sea, and the other fear lifts us up to Jesus. We are born, we are created to fear, but because we're the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, we stopped fearing the right thing. We stopped fearing God, and we started fearing 
the creation instead of the creator. Now, fearing God is, is actually pretty simple. The Bible tells us how to do it. We need to do what God says. But fearing creation is not simple at all. It gets really, really complicated. It's all based on a lie, and lies get complicated really quickly. They get complicated and ugly and panicky and burdensome, and we start to sink. So I wonder if Peter was thinking about the Sea of Galilee when he wrote his first epistle. He said, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So what is God calling us to do? What can we not do right now? Because we've voluntarily taken on all these burdens and all these cares that God did not give us to carry. So we need to shed those pounds and you need to cast your burden on the Father because he cares for you. And I need to cast my burdens on the Father because he cares for me. Let's pray. Lord God, Master of the winds and the waves, Creator who lifts up mountains and casts down your enemies, keep us humble. Teach us true fear. Don't let us live with our burdens, but teach us to roll them to you and throw them away forever so that we can step out of the boat in faith and walk alongside you because there is nothing we would rather do. Now hear the prayers of your people calling out in our hearts for forgiveness to you, the Father who cares for us. Amen. Now hear the words of assurance. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now let us stand and sing. Psalm 5, hymn number 2.
please remain standing for the doxology. Lord God, we bring our tithes and offerings to you because we fear you more than we fear lack of money and because we love you more than we love money. Jesus, when we start to sink, you reach out and hold us. Thank you. Amen. Standing? You remain standing. Okay. And the three and younger can okay. go to the nursery. Okay. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <Jeremiah. laughs> uh, very good. Let's all turn together to Acts chapter 21, please. And uh, you can turn it up just a little bit more. Thank you. All right, Acts 21, and I'll be reading through chapter 22, verse 22, starting in verse 37 of 21. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, for whom I also received letters, or warrants, to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to, who, who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, Suddenly, a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who are with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, 
Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, he came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen that you should know his will and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, that I was in a trance, and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you, believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen, or Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. That ends his speech, and then we see the response from the crowd. And they listened to him until this word, the word Gentiles. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Let us pray. <clears throat> God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you reveal yourself in this passage and what you are accomplishing through your Son by the Spirit, and that, this, that your full intention is for us, even today, to be strengthened. I do pray, Lord Christ, that you would strengthen your disciples through the preaching and hearing of your word. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Last week was my most popular sermon in all of my pastoral history, which isn't long. But I had more people come up to me last week about the sermon than any other sermon. And you know why? Because my sermon was on equity. And when I first announced that my sermon was on equity, they thought I was going to give them governmental job place equity training. And they became very concerned. I assure you that if they had tomatoes under their seats, I would have been hit by a fruit, because it is a fruit. But they said to me that they were quite pleased <clears throat> once they decided to stay in their seat and not leave. They were, they were quite pleased to find out that I was speaking about a kind of equity that is not taught today. We could, if you want, call it Christian equity as opposed to perhaps secular equity. But I would just like to call it real equity versus fake equity, if you don't mind. What we saw last week was an equity demonstrated from James and Paul in Acts, and it is not the same of what we hear today. I have not done the research, but it seems to me that our culture has stolen the word and redefined it. I leave it up to you to keep sending me things so I can better understand how people are using the word equity today. But I hope that you understand how it was used throughout the Christian church well into the ages, and it is quite simply this, equity is justice and mercy holding hands. And you know there's an even simpler way. Equity is exactly how Jesus Christ rules every situation. That's equity. Equity is the Son, equity is the Father, and equity is the Holy Spirit. Well, this week we move on in hopes that Christ will continue to strengthen us we move from equity into some other things that the church must consider to be the church. 
And so I'd like to make a few observations about Paul's wonderful speech here, and I'm sure it's just a summary of all that he has said, but let's make a few observations together and then get into some of the application to become stronger in the Lord for his glory. Well, here's the first observation. This whole section is an apologetic or a defense of Paul's divine ordination as an apostle to the Gentiles. I want you to take a look at chapter 22, verse 1. It's a very special word being used here. He says, brethren and fathers, hear my apologia, or apologia, or defense. That's where we get our word apologetic from. He says, Brothers, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And we can break this defense down into four main things that he's saying. The very first thing he starts off with is in verse 3. And he recounts under Gamaliel his premier education in the law that this crowd was so zealous for. Number two, in verses 4 and 5, he recounts his zeal and defense of that same law, even willing to kill those who seemed to stand against it. That um, reference back to Stephen's, or Stephen's martyrdom with the clothes laid at his feet. And then number three, the third point of his speech is in verses 9 through 16. He did not carelessly change from his understanding of the law to a different understanding. But instead, he was interrupted and confronted by God himself on the road to Damascus. The Son of God became flesh. The Son of God in his ascension spoke to him and told him, verse 14, the truth and what he was to do. And then lastly, in verses 17 through 21, Paul therefore explains that he was the one that received the commission from God himself, a divine mandate to go to the Gentiles. Well, we know as soon as he mentions the word Gentile that it's not going over well. And that brings us into our second observation. You can see in verse 22 that many of those Jews did not accept Paul's testimony of what God is doing among the Gentiles. And this creates a great divide that you will see represented in the New Testament letters. You now officially have a group of Jews, the apostles, who have determined in their official council in Acts 15 that God has always planned to gather the nations to himself. The image given is that of a foreign branch grafted into an ancient rootstock of Adam and Abraham. On the other hand, for a multitude of reasons, another group of Israelites refuse to admit that this is the truth of what God is doing. They refuse to permit the new administration of the covenant, wherein Gentiles will become equal with Israelites as co-heirs of the new heavens and the new earth. They have always been fine with Gentiles on the outer court of the temple, but now they may draw near to the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus. The ground is level at the cross. And they are unwilling to accept that at this point. They don't think that is what God has taught throughout the ages. And this means that some Israelites forgot or never knew their main purpose, or the main purpose of their existence. They were meant to be a light to the nations as the good news of what God is doing with the whole world, but somehow and in some way, the gospel had become corrupted under their leadership. And that brings us to observation number three. Those hard-hearted Israelites related to Paul, just like they related to Jesus, just like they related to the prophets before him. I want you to notice a repeated phrase. The first time we see it is uh, last week, actually, in, verse 20, in chapter 21, verse 36. Away with him! And now we see it again in 22, 22, Away with him. 
Now, does that sound familiar to you? If you have attended here for any length of time, you know that we teach you to read the Scriptures analogously. Where have you heard that before? Certainly, it is from Luke 23, 18 through 20. We are to have this framed by way of that. Luke writes this, And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, or Barabbas. And it continues saying, Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. I'm sure you remember that from some of our Friday services. Paul will summarize this same understanding of what was going on with him as him walking in the shoes of Christ into Jerusalem and there being a crowd saying the same thing to Paul that was said to Christ earlier in history. Paul summarizes this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16, speaking to this church in Thessalonica. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as the Jews did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and they have persecuted us. And what this ends up bringing us to, that we can hold on to as a reality to strengthen us as a church, to understand who we are, who God is, and what He's doing, <clears throat> is the following doctrine. The Son of God descended from heaven with the eternal counsels of God. He gave that good news to prophets and apostles. They testified and they gave witness to this reality. They are witnesses and appointed to Jew and Gentile. And now that baton has been passed to you in the post-apostolic age. The church is entrusted with the task of witnessing to who God is, what He is doing, and what He requires of us. We are tasked with the continuance of apostolic testimony. And here is the icing on the cake. Sometimes when you witness it will include having to defend the faith. Sometimes witnessing includes defense. That's the short version of it. Sometimes witnessing includes defense. So what I would like to look at are two things here, uh, two main points for our application, and that is defending and thank God the second point is that we are defended. So let's go into that application now, realizing that this baton will be, is passed to us as a church, and in our witness it will include apologetics or defense. I was just reading an article. I wonder if some of you read the same one. <clears throat> it was called uh, The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. Anyone? Crickets. <clears throat> Great. It's called The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. I thought the person did a pretty good job. Uh, it's at least helpful in evaluating our current situation as evangelicals. He makes the argument that before 1994, our culture, generally speaking, related to evangelicals, that's us. They related to us positively, if you could remember a time. To be known as a good church-going person remained part of being an upstanding citizen. Does anybody remember when days were like that? Well, something shifted in 1994 to 2014, the argument continued, and our culture became neutral to evangelicals. Christianity no longer had a privileged status, status but it also was not exactly disfavored. Christianity became a valid option among many options within a pluralistic society. You do you, <clears throat> you do you, I'll do me <clears throat> kind of mentality. Well, he continues to make a further argument that from 2014 to the present, where there's still pockets of 1994 to 2014, especially in suburbia and rural areas, but more and more, the, America is being characterized as negatively 
associated towards evangelicals. It has shifted from positive to neutral, now to negative, and he expects this to continue. Being known as a Christian is a social negative, particularly in the elite domains of society. I don't think there's any argument there. Christian, Christian morality, morality is expressly repudiated and, and seen, seen as, as a threat, threat to, to the, the public pu good and the new public moral order. I think we all see a lot of truth right there, that he's done a good job of evaluating this. Now, the way ev evangelicals have responded in each age has been determined by how the culture would relate to you. So he makes the argument that what, what the church was able to do in a positive culture basically falls under the category of a moral majority. And that movement, you can look that up on your own time. It's not important to the sermon today. In a neutral culture, it was largely cultural engagement, seeking people to win them over that among all of the various systems, this is the truth. But now the big question, question has become, and people are still trying to answer it, how do we respond as Christian evangelicals in a negative culture? I actually, uh, in my position, have found it's all pretty much everybody's question. Grandmas are trying to figure out how to relate to their grandkids, and underneath of it is this question. How do I relate in a negative culture? Well, this picture of Paul in a negative setting, to say the least, uh, right before the, uh, his speech, he was beat. He was beaten and was only saved by a guard. We certainly can characterize what Paul is doing as in a setting of defense. And of course, he uses that word in 22.1. He used the apologetics or defense defense. And so it is here that we too can be strengthened in a negative era toward Christianity, knowing that we will have to move into a time of defense sometimes. To be a witness, sometimes you will have to defend. But here's the thing. What are the first things that come to your mind when I say the word apologetics to you? Are you thinking that you need to take a logic course and learn all the logical fallacies and syllogisms and enthymemes and yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see, although Paul is capable of that, I don't see him doing that here. And when we look at the a parallel account in 1 Peter where we're called as Christians to make a defense and to give the hope, I don't see that call of uh, logical fallacies and syllogisms and enthymemes and studying Aristotle's rhetoric and all that there either. Though some people will have to do that because of their circumstances. Paul's defense is actually quite surprising because it's a defense that all of us could give. Paul's defense is quite plainly him telling the Jews a story about his calling <clears throat> and what God told him to do based on what he, God, is doing through Jesus Christ. Paul is essentially giving them a rationale for his behavior based upon what God says. God sent Christ to tell me what his plans are with the Gentiles, Paul uh, says in a paraphrase. This included changes in the administration of the covenant of grace, especially the ritual laws. Given God's plan, he appointed me to certain responsibilities among the Gentiles, and I'm just trying to seek to carry those things out for God. It's a bench, uh, basically what he says on the top of those steps. And what I find interesting is underneath of that argument from Paul, can you hear that it's the same argument that has been given by the other apostles whenever they are put into a defensive mode? For example, Acts chapter 4, 19 through 20, it's really the same kind of defense. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Paul's just doing that. He's saying, I have seen and I have heard, and you judge whether it's right for me to listen to God or to listen to you. And they go, oh, okay, well, yeah. I mean, it's a nice argument. But he really is just relaying what he has seen and what he has heard, what he has learned about what his vocation is before God. 
Now, what I want to do is I want to put you in the story. I want you to be on the stage where you would have to give, to, uh, give a defense. And God has, preparing, has been preparing us to be successful at this. I have a series of catechism questions for you. Are you ready? Do you have your catechism memorized? No, you don't. Not, not all of you. I have a different catechism for you. I have a series of questions, and then I, I'm going to give you the answers. So you're going to have a 100% success rate this morning. Has God spoken to you through Christ and His Spirit? I want you to put yourself in Paul's shoes. That you could see that you can make the same defense, no matter who you are here this morning as a Christian. Has God spoken to you through Christ and His Spirit? Why, yes, He has, is the answer to this catechism question. In the context of the community of the church, God has given me His Scriptures. And His Spirit guides me in the context of that community. That's the first question and answer. Question and answer number two. Did Christ by the Spirit and the Word reveal to you what you are appointed to in God's kingdom? Just like He did to Paul. Why, yes, He did. He revealed that, first, I am effectually called to faith and repentance. And now I profess to be a child of God and a Christian by His grace he has given me faith and hope and love by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a child of God, I serve my Father in the family, I serve Him in the church, and I serve Him in civil society. Those are my appointments. Did Christ in His Word reveal to you what He is doing with His creation and therefore how you should steward all of the domains of your life? Well, yes, again, He did. Primarily, I'm learning that he has done so in the fifth commandment as it is unfolded. And then here comes the big question. What if someone comes along and laughs at you? What if someone comes along, even if it's a family member, and they're disappointed in you as a Christian? What if someone comes along and they are angry with you? What if someone comes along and they fine you? What if someone comes along and they hit you? What if someone comes along and they kill you? Well, except for that last one, because you're not going to talk anymore. How do you respond? And it's the same response that we see underneath of all of the apologetics in the Scriptures whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge. For I cannot but live and speak that which I have seen and heard in the Scriptures. That what I have seen and heard God tell me from His Word in the context of community what it means to be a mother and what it means to be a widow and what it means to be a grandmother and what it means to be a daughter and what it means to be a sinner, and what it means that I must repent, and what it means to have faith. He has shown me all these things, and I've heard them on Sunday mornings. You judge whether it's right for me to do what God has said or what you have said. And you can get down into specifics, which I would encourage you to do. That, my friends, is the defense. That is the defense. That, my friends, is how you live in the negative world era as an evangelical. I'm sure there's so much more to talk about under that defense, but that is the beginning that we see here with Paul, that we relate to people what we have seen and heard in the Scriptures given to us from God. But there is also another element here within this passage, and this will be quite short. I hope to develop this another time. But we must not only be defending in the way that Paul teaches us to give our apologetic, but we must also be defended. And I'll tell you, actually, <clears throat> this is a far more important point, even though it's shorter. I don't care how silver-tongued you are. You need Christ to defend you. And I just want to point out a few things here.
that we respond in a negative culture not only by defending but by being defended. And even in our defending, we must have that kind of courage knowing that we're defended in it. Defending is only the first answer. The second is that we must keep our faith and hope that Christ defends us, which is one of the reasons we chose Psalm 5 this morning to sing, because it ends on that note, that he would cover your defenseless head with his wing, that he would be your shield to you. And that is what we see, in fact, in this passage too, is it not? Did you notice all of the providential moves of Christ in the passage? I'd encourage you to go back and reread these sections just looking for how is Christ showing up providentially in order for the mission to continue. Paul is under the hands of a group of people that want to kill him, and they are beating him. And then in verse 31, under Christ's providence, the commander of the garrison catches news as to what's happening, and he runs out and pulls him to safety. And there are many other examples we could give through these accounts of Christ controlling situations in ways that are uncanny to us, but nevertheless, he is in control. He knows everything that is going on. And my favorite verse to show you is in a future chapter, which we'll get to, which is in chapter 23, verse 11. Look at how Christ has been thinking of all of these events throughout time and how he continues to think about these things. How he is fully aware of what his people go through and he interrupts at just the right time according to his will and plan. Jesus shows up. If you have a red letter Bible, all of a sudden there's red letters in your Bible in chapter 23, verse 11. The ascended Christ speaks and he says this to Paul who was just beat up in the temple. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul. <laughs> I wonder if he was laughing just like I'm laughing right now. Be of good cheer. This is funny, Paul. No, I don't think he would say that. But he says, be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. There he is. And I just wonder if you see the kind of faith that we are meant to have as to how present the ascended Christ is with us in defending and controlling all situations that his kingdom might advance. There's a little glimmer for you. Christ planned the whole thing. Christ is not threatened by any of it. He made the news go to the guard. And he tells us because of this, and because of his continuing advance and what that means for all nations, be of good cheer. This is what it's like to serve under me. Be joyful. Well, those are quite the lessons that take a lifetime to learn, honestly. And I don't think we even arrive at the end of our lives. But we know that in the post-apostolic age, the church is entrusted with the task of witnessing to who God is, what he is doing with his creation, and what he requires of us. And we can see here, as well as many other examples, that sometimes witnessing includes defense. Well, that doesn't need to be overly complicated and academic is the, another lesson here. We defend by reminding people that we must obey God rather than men. We are simply saying and doing what we have learned from God in his word in the context of his church. But more importantly, actually, no matter how silver-tongued we are, we are defended. And one of the primary effects of that should be that we should be a church of good cheer. I leave you with these words from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, 
with meekness, and with fear. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for these lessons in the school of Christ. Lord, it is one thing to hear these things, and it is another thing to do them. We need a professional trainer and life coach to bring us through time to a place where we could actually be of good cheer while we face a negative age. But that is what you have given to us. You have sent us your spirit and have not left us as orphans. You continue to act the same way now as you did with Paul. And I pray that you would give your congregation ears to hear and eyes to see as you work in your providence to defend them. Your ways are not our ways. If we had it our way, we would have stepped in before Paul was being beaten. But Lord, you are the one with wisdom. Who are we to question you? I pray, Lord, that in the midst of this, you would give us wills that are willing to submit to how you will let things unfold. And that at the same time, Lord, you will give your people to remember that above the clouds, though they be dark and stormy, are blue skies. And that when these clouds part, we will see you were there all along, holding us. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all of the witnesses to your faithfulness as we see in Israelite armies. And may you give us the courage and the same faith that your saints have always need to have. Faith in you as our great warrior who will defend us and cover our heads with your wing. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Let us stand and prepare for the Lord's Supper with our invitational hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I'd ask the elders to please prepare the table.
Amen. Please be seated. By the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ and knowing what his saints will need, he has given us this sacrament, the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is a meal that the Lord has put together for the strength of his disciples. This is not a meal to the general public, which means if you are not a Christian, If you don't understand who Christ is and what the Father is doing through Him and what Christ is doing through His Spirit, if you have not made that profession of faith and uh, thereupon been baptized, or if you are a child who has grown up in the church and has rightfully received your baptism, but you still are not able to articulate or discern who Christ is, then Christ himself gives the the rules that you are not to come to this table. But his gospel message of wisdom is going out to all of the nations, as we have just heard. And I wonder if he is calling you. If so, I encourage you to speak to myself or one of these elders. We have... uh, if you even need this, an apologetic for you as to why Christ is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. He is all that you need and all that your heart has been wrestles for. That your life is found in serving Him and His desires. For those of you who are professed Christians, what I've been saying is not news to you. You have heard this gospel before. But Christ wants you to be strengthened in it. He wants you to remember what he's doing with his creation and what he's doing with you. You get to come here this morning and by faith see the bread and see the wine to eat and to know. He knows that as a creature you need these tangible objects for your faith. And this morning I want to remind you of one single truth. You can see in the broken bread and in the wine and the grape juice, that Jesus Christ has purchased you with his own body and blood, and you are no longer your own. You exist to serve him. And if someone challenges you on how you are serving him as a parent or a grandparent, then I would encourage you to have a polite conversation in meekness and in fear, to let them know, you must serve God. You have no choice to listen to their words if they are against him. May that be the testimony of our faith in a thousand situations. We'll distribute the bread. Uh, The elders will distribute the bread, and then we will take that as a family. And then when we are done that portion, we'll distribute the wine and grape juice. We'll take that as a family. And um, please know that the small dishes have gluten-free bread. I, I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. We need each other. That was a great example. <clears throat> Let me read the, uh, again the, the warning that Christ gives to us in his grace to not come to the table unless you are a professing Christian. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick, and many die. But it does not need to be like that. Repentance and faith are available as long as it is called today.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat this bread and by faith see in it Christ's defense of you from his righteous wrath. Let us take and eat. Lord Jesus Christ, in your grace and your mercy, you permitted Paul to see you, the just one. And you gave Paul an understanding of your heavenly will and how you are executing it on earth. You have furthermore, by the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, inscripturated the apostolic understanding of what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are doing to their own glory. We thank you that this deposit has been handed down to us. And we ask, in light of your sacrifice for us, that we would continue your continual defense of us, that you would give us the courage to guard this deposit of faith in word and deed, that you would do so even in an age that is negative. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Brothers, let us do the same with the wine. The wine is on the perimeter, and the center colored glasses are grape juice.
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You do realize that Paul, having been beaten and and then saved by the guard and standing at the top of the steps, that he was defending your right as a Gentile to eternal life. May we never take for granted that we too may join the stream to Zion, that the curtain is torn and we may enter in by the blood of Jesus Christ into the Holy of Holies, no longer kept in the outer circle of the temple. Let us take and drink. Lord Jesus Christ, it is only through you that we are able to declare by your calling that we are children of God and citizens of the commonwealth of Israel, that we are, in fact, members of the city of God. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would look down across all of the world on your day, and you would see the fruit that has been born from your deeds, from your love. Look down upon the execution of the decree of the Father and the fruit of the Spirit. And we look forward to that day when you shall gather the full harvest and we shall see you face to face with the host of angels. Until then, we ask that you would give us lips that can defend But most importantly, we ask that you would please defend us. In the name of Christ, amen. 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 Let us stand and sing to our Lord.
Amen. And now receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. One moment before you guys dismiss, I have a quick announcement. Um, our treasurer, Peggy Young, has put together all of the, the yearly giving for last year. She's back there in the last row, or back there, out there. She's wearing a Steelers t-shirt. She needs you to go to her because there's so many fresh faces. She may not recognize you by name and face. So please just go to our treasurer, Peggy, and she will uh, give you your...